Mr. Secretary, you've served eight presidents. When you saw the firing of James Comey, the director of the FBI, how did that strike you based on your experience? Um, not terribly well done. <laughs> you know, I fired a lot of senior people myself. And I think the, the key when you feel compelled to uh, remove a senior official is essentially to have all your ducks in a row uh, at the beginning. To, to have the rationale, have everybody understand what the rationale was, uh, if possible, uh, to be in a position to announce who is going to step in uh, as the interim immediately, and if possible, to announce who you're going to nominate to replace that person. And so being able to go forward with, uh, put forward a name of somebody that you would like to have as the candidate to be in that position, for that to be somebody of impeccable integrity and reputation disarms a lot of the worst criticism that it's some kind of a power play. And so it's just a matter of how you, I think, I think it was George Will that referred to it as the stagecraft of statecraft. And, but it's basically showing it's a professional approach to replacing a senior official, which is always going to get a lot of attention. It's always going to be contentious, but, but having a, a, a single story in line in terms of how it happened and why it happened, uh, that everybody is on the same page, and then what the next steps are, I think helps to diminish uh, the blowback that you get. What is the cost of an, for an administration if there is blowback as a result of a lack of having a professional approach? Well, I think, I think you see the kind of sort of media firestorm um, that we've seen over the last couple of days. And, and I think there would always have been a lot of coverage, but I think you can significantly mitigate it. Is there a message this sends, if there's not a professional approach in taking care of somebody at a senior level, does it send a message inside the vast administration in terms of the way the, a president works, in terms of the way decisions get made? I think it, I mean, it's still early days, okay? I think sometimes people forget we're just barely 100 days in. And I think in some ways this is a, this is a reflection of the fact that this is still a new administration. And, and you have a White House filled with people who have never served in the White House before, who have no government experience, uh, and, and that it's different. It's a different environment. And, and I think that, um, that that's one of those learning experiences in terms of how you orchestrate these things for the future that, that hopefully is a lesson learned. That, that um, if you're going to take an action like this, you need to think through the first several chapters, not just sort of going out in front and announcing uh, that somebody's gone. Does this instance, well, let me ask it another way. You were critical of President Trump as a candidate. You wrote that he was unfit to be commander in chief. When you look at him now, early days, as you said, but when you look at his presidency, how do you evaluate it? Well, I would look at it particularly from the arena I'm most familiar with, and that's national security. And I would say that after a pretty rough transition and first couple of weeks, the national security side of the team and the administration seems to be settling in pretty well. I think that uh, he has surrounded himself with very strong, independent-minded people. Um, uh, Rex Tillerson, Jim Mattis, John Kelly, uh, H.R. McMaster. I know all these people. I gave a couple of them jobs uh, or promoted them to senior commands. Uh, and clearly not Rex Tillerson. <laughs> but I followed Rex as president of the Boy Scouts. And these are strong people. And I think they're, and they have developed a good sense of teamwork among themselves. And I think they've developed a, a strong working relationship with the president. And I think, I think in a lot of areas of foreign policy, you've seen that manifested 
in, in some pretty uh, positive developments. Uh, so I, I would say that on the, on the policy side, on national security, it seems to me the team is settling in pretty well, shows a good learning curve, and, and I, think, uh, uh, I think there's a lot of, lot of positive things going on on that side. You mentioned Secretary of State Tillerson, but you you did recommend him for the job, so you did have a little hand in that. Absolutely, and I, you know, I mean, I. Many of these people that have been appointed to various jobs have talked to me, and I have encouraged every one of them to join up. I say, you know, it's your duty to the country. Uh, it is critical for all of us. Uh, Donald Trump is going to be our president for at least four years, and particularly in national security matters, it's critical for all of us that he be successful. And so if you can help him be successful, you should go do the job. Let me ask you about that question of duty, a very important concept to you. You titled your book about it. In the reporting about the FBI director, there was a report that the president asked him for his loyalty. Help people understand the line between duty, loyalty, and personal conscience in this modern world. Well, I think, I think in the context of senior government positions, <clears throat> I, I think that um, something that I, I, I think an anecdote of what I told President Obama, President-elect Obama, when we had our first meeting. Um, and I said, you don't know me, you know, can you trust me? Why do you think you can trust me? And so on. But at the end I said, um, you can count on me to be loyal to you. I will not leak. I will keep my disagreements with you private. And, I, and if I cannot be loyal, I'll leave. So my mantra has always been, be loyal or be gone. But loyalty, loyalty means doing what you think is in the best interest of that person as well as the country. And often that loyalty means telling them things they don't want to hear. That's the real meaning of loyalty in my view. It's not, it's not being sycophantic. It's not telling them how wonderful they are every day. It's being willing to tell them the days they're not wonderful. And when you think they're making a mistake, and loyalty is all about trying to help them be them, their best self in a position. I had, I had people working around me as Secretary of Defense that I considered very loyal, who were always telling me things that I was doing wrong, or that I could do better, or where I was headed in a wrong direction. And I never considered them disloyal. In a, high, in a perfectly functioning uh, either White House or Pentagon, how often should you be told uh, that you're that you're doing something wrong, or that somebody should tell you no. How much a part of that uh, should be a part of a, a good operating procedure? Well, I think, first of all, in any setting, let's be honest. When the boss says, most bosses say, "I want your candor. I want you to tell me when you think I'm doing something wrong." Until you do, <laughs> and then a lot of people have found out. Well, maybe they didn't want that candor after all. <laughs> And, and have found themselves out on the street. Uh, I think you obviously have to be judicious about it. I mean, if you're going in carping at your boss every day, you're probably not gonna last very long. But I think on the big things, that's where it's important to be, to, to, to tell yourself, this is important for this person, it's important for the country, and I owe it to them to disagree. And I will tell you, I had some significant disagreements at various times with President Obama over the defense budget, over how we would get rid of don't ask, don't tell, and so on. And, and we would go at it sometimes in the Oval Office, in private, but at the end, more often than not, he would stand up and smile and say, are you sure I can't get you to stay for another year? So it's, it's, it's a two-sided coin. The employee needs to be willing, the subordinate needs to be willing to tell the truth to power. But the boss needs to be big enough 
to recognize that person is actually trying to help them. One of your concerns about President Trump was that there would not be somebody in his orbit who could tell him no and that he would accept it. Do you have a view about how that's worked out? Well, I still have confidence that the people that I know personally, people like Kelly and, and Mattis and Tillerson, uh, are the kind of people who will tell the president if he's headed down the wrong path. You know, there are a lot of different ways to to do this with a boss. I mean, you don't walk in and say, that's the dumbest thing you've ever done, or at least this week. But it's another to say, you know, there's a different way to do this that might come out better. And so it does require a certain tactical skill in terms of how you do this. But you know, the truth is, John, this is true of every, anybody in any organization in the country. It doesn't matter whether it's in a school or a business or a government. It, it's how are you gonna tell your boss that he's headed down the wrong track and to try and get him to course correct. What's your sense overall of President Trump as an unpredictable leader? He has talked about that as an asset, that in the foreign policy realm, you never know where he's gonna go. Um, give us a sense of how useful that can be and also the challenges of that kind of approach. Well, let me say, first of all, that um, broadly, philosophically, I am in agreement with uh, his disruptive approach. So in government, I'm a strong believer in the need for reform of government agencies and departments. Uh, they, they have gotten fat and sloppy and they're not user friendly. Uh, they are inefficient. Uh, they cost too much. And, and so I think there really is a need to reform government in fundamental ways and, and the departments within government. I also think on the foreign policy side that there is a need for disruption. And frankly, you know, we've had three administrations follow a pretty consistent policy toward North Korea, and it really hasn't gotten us anywhere. So the notion of disrupting and sort of putting the Chinese on notice that it's no longer business as usual for the United States, I think is a good thing. I was, I was at the end of a long line of American officials telling the Europeans that they weren't spending enough on defense. So uh, the president going at them in a more direct manner, I think actually um, has its benefits. Now the question is, obviously in, in the implementation of disruption, and for example, I think in reforming big institutions, you need to make the people inside those institutions your allies. That's the way I've done it in the intelligence community at Texas A&M University and, and in the Defense Department. It's only by getting the senior people to buy into your agenda and then go be your missionaries, if you will, that you can bring change to these organizations. And I think the figuring out the how of reforming government is still very much a work in progress for the administration. On the foreign policy side, there's the risk of being too spontaneous and uh, too disruptive where you end up doing more harm than damage. And figuring out that, that balance is where having strong people around you matters. So in the, to the extent that people have been uh put off guard by the president and his improvisational approach and the operational tempo of this administration, which has been fast. Is, is it your view that this is what disruption looks like uh, and there are modifications to be made, but that, that a lot of what people see is it makes them unsettled about this administration, that that might just be the byproduct of disruption? Well, I think, take, take reforming government, if you will. I think it, and it's the same way in a little bit in foreign policy, you need to get people's attention, that the agenda is going to change, it is going to be different. But then what you have to follow that with is, a, is actually a strategy for how you're actually going to accomplish what it is that you're after. And, and this is where the absence of confirmed officials in these departments is a huge hindrance to the president's agenda and to trying to reform uh, these uh, departments and agencies because those are the people that become the missionaries within the department uh, to help bring about change. Does the president need 
somebody like you who's had some experience, there's not somebody in this process who's, who knows what you're talking about, about working with inside agencies, who's, who can run the traps in, in, in Washington. Does he need a kind of what we would have in the old days called a wise man in his orbit? Well, I think <clears throat> I, my view is that um, there is, is, there's probably, it's probably not a great idea to have somebody to be sort of the appointed wise man. <laughs> but I think, I think the willingness of a president to bring people in from time to time, I noticed that he had Henry Kissinger in a couple of days ago. And so I think on foreign policy, talking to people like Henry and, and so on is a good thing. Uh, I'm not sure anybody in the administration, most of the people in the administration um, have no experience in government. And, and you know, I've, I've joked with some of these, these folks, and uh, I can't remember whether I had uh, this exact conversation with Rex Tillerson or not, but at one point or another I said, can you imagine you're the corporate executive and you have a board of directors of 535 people, none of whose interests are aligned with yours or your organizations. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's the difference between government and the private sector. And, and part of the concern that I have is that at senior levels, there really isn't anybody who has had those experiences and can offer some good advice in terms of how you bring change and how you do some of these things. You've been in a cri crisis atmosphere. Give me your sense of how you think this White House could handle a crisis. Well, again, I'm, I'm again, looking at it from a foreign policy standpoint. I, I think they could do pretty well. I mean, I'm, I'm comforted by having H.R. McMaster there, who would be the guy sort of orchestrating the crisis management. That's the role of the National Security Advisor. Uh, and then the steadfastness of people like Mattis, who have been in a lot of crises and gotten those three o'clock calls all too often, and, and, but just solid guys like uh, Rex Tillerson and, and John Kelly and so on. So I think the people around the president in terms of framing up good options for him and sensible options, I think, I think that's as good a team uh, as you could hope for. What advice would you give the president before his first big foreign trip that he's about to take? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, I think that um, I think that the key will, will be to to limit spontaneity <clears throat> to to areas that are fun or um, that sort of say something about you as a real person. I think when it comes to the issue, I, issues, I'd, I'd advise him to stick to the script. But, I mean, he is gonna have some very tough conversations and he's gonna be talking about some very tough and complicated issues in all of the places that he visits. And, but I think, I think any time a president does things that are humanizing, uh, I think it's it's good. Should the use of Twitter stop at the water's edge? <laughs> well, not necessarily, it, but it, I, I would uh, be careful. <laughs> Let me ask you about uh, national security, uh, former national security advisor Michael Flynn. You used to be head of the CIA. If you got information that the national security advisor had not told the truth about a contact with a Russian ambassador, how serious of an issue would that be if it were if it were brought to you? Well, I would certainly make sure that the president knew that, um, that we had learned this. Um, and, I, and the way I would frame it, because if you're um, a director of CIA or in a position like that, you're not in a position to investigate anybody domestically. But if we got that information in an intelligence report, then, then, then I would probably have sought a private meeting with the president uh, to share that with him. You know the Russians, you know uh, this area of information. The, the concern was that the Russians would be able to blackmail the former national security advisor because of what they, they knew he had said something untrue and then caused the vice president to say something untrue. 
Is that a plausible, possible outcome and something to be worried I, about? You know, in all honesty, I think it's kind of a stretch. Um, you know, it's one thing if somebody working for the U.S. government has sold secrets to the other side. It's another if they have something in their personal life that they're hiding for which they could be blackmailed. Um, having evidence that they didn't tell the truth uh, to somebody in the same building where they work, uh, maybe it's just the old intel guy, is, is it's a problem. And it's a problem, like I just said, that I would tell the president about. But it's not the same as, and, and it's hard for me, I don't know General Flynn well, but it's hard for me to believe anybody would allow themselves to be blackmailed by the Russians because they didn't tell the full story or didn't tell the truth to the Vice President of the United States, who works 50 feet down the hall. You know, maybe he could have been blackmailed. It's theoretically possible. I, I just think it's a, different, it's a different kind of situation than we would have thought of in the intelligence business. The president met with the Russian uh, foreign minister and the ambassador in the Oval Office. There were pictures of them smiling in the Oval Office. What did you make of that meeting? You know about these kinds of meetings. What was the message being sent? What did you make of that? Well, I think here again, uh, you know, <clears throat> Washington's attention span is about a week, and its knowledge of history is about a week. <laughs> and, you know, for a long time, uh, Soviet foreign ministers would come in to see the president all the time, routinely. And for sure, every September when the foreign minister would come to the UN, he'd come down to Washington and meet with the president. Jimmy Carter stopped that after the invasion of Afghanistan. Ronald Reagan resumed it in 1984, I think. And, and so the fact of a meeting like that, I think, is not that big a deal. The Trump White House kept American photographers and press out of the room. The phot photographs were released by the Russians. America occasionally gives Russia advice about how to treat the First Amendment, or that they don't have a First Amendment, but how to treat a free press. What, what, what do you make of that? I thought that was all pretty odd. <laughs> <laughs> pretty odd. Yeah. Not worth repeating. Um, there is a there is important business on the table with Russia all over the, the world, but there is also this. The intelligence community has a consensus that the Russians tried to meddle in the last election, that they did meddle in the last election. So people look at the smiling photographs in the Oval Office, and they look at this effort to meddle in the election, and they say, "Is there a disconnect there? Should should there be sterner faces and and a harsher uh, approach to Russia, given that they tried to un, uh, tried to mess with an election?" Well, I think in the policies that have been followed uh, since the president came into office, um, there really hasn't been any slack cut for the Russians. And I think one of the things that has surprised people uh, has been that the relationship between the United States and Russia has, in fact, deteriorated uh, since the election. And uh, with uh, Secretary Tillerson saying it's at one of the lowest points ever, uh, president basically echoing that. So I think that the administration in its statements and in its uh, actions have, have, have sort of, um, I mean, the contrast between the way they have treated the Russians <clears throat> and the way they have reacted to the Chinese is pretty, uh, is pretty stark. So, you know, having smiles in the Oval Office, uh, I, I don't know, maybe Maybe I'm just getting too old, but I don't think that's that big a deal. It's, it's in their policies and in their actions that, that, it, that it really matters. And in those, in those arenas, I think they've been pretty tough-minded. Some analysts of Russia look at Russia and say what, what Vladimir Putin really wanted by being involved in the U.S. election was just to throw the West into a kind of chaotic state, to undermine U.S. institutions. Do you think, both in the election and in the aftermath, in the way it's being... Uh, talked about and covered and dealt with by Congress and the FBI, that Putin is getting what he wants? Well, I think that he is certainly getting a lot of publicity for what the Russians are doing. And I'm not sure that's unwelcome to him. Look, I think this is a guy who saw the U.S. basically come out against him in his reelection campaign in 2012. 
he saw the U.S. being behind all of the color revolutions in Eastern Europe and in Georgia and Ukraine and so on. So his view is the West has been interfering in, in his politics uh, for years. And I think that he has uh, decided uh, in a very strategic way to turn the tables and do everything in his power to, as we describe Russian elections as illegitimate, to try and communicate to the rest of the world that Western elections are illegitimate. And it's not just us. We know that now. It's Germany. It's France. Uh, it's uh, a number of other countries. And it's a very broad and not very well disguised effort uh, to, to create questions about the legitimacy of these Western elections. And I, I think, I mean, this is very KGB. Yeah. For Americans trying to sort through the, the Russia question and what to think about Russia, what is the thing they should keep their eye on the ball about? Is it about what's happening in Syria? Is it about Ukraine? Is it about the election? Is it about cyber? What's the most important thing to pay attention to when thinking about Russia and US relations? Well, I think, you know, when I introduced um, Secretary Tillerson at his, at his uh, confirmation hearing, I said, I thought the biggest challenge facing the administration was going to be trying to figure out how to push back against Putin in all of the areas you just described, and yet at the same time try and find a way uh, to stop the downward spiral in this relationship. Um, we are at odds with the Russians uh, almost everywhere. Um, and and their, their activities in Iran are a concern, um, and uh, not to mention Eastern Europe and uh, the Middle East and elsewhere. So, so I think it's not, it's not just one thing, but it's the overall arc of the relationship with, with Russia. And, you know, I don't want, I, we should not in any way excuse or overlook Putin's bad behavior in any of these places. And those are the places where I think we need to push back on him. But we also need to be looking for places. So, okay, where, where, where are the issues where we might be able to cooperate? Where can we get this thing on a different track? In North Korea, the president is relying very heavily on China. Um, what do you make of his use of China? Is he uh, relying too much on China so that it makes it hard for him to push back on China when it comes to the South China Sea or human rights or intellectual property rights? My, uh, first of all, as, I, as I've indicated, I think that, um, that the disruptive nature, the, the tough talk on North Korea, uh, the military deployments, sending the missile defense system to South Korea, I think these are all good things to have done. And I think he's gotten China's attention to a degree that his predecessors have not that this is a very serious matter uh, for the United States. My last visit to China as secretary, January 2011, I told President Hu, just like this, President of the United States wanted me to tell you that we now consider North Korea a direct threat to the United States. And it had no effect whatsoever. I think President Trump has their attention. And <clears throat> my one concern is that he may overestimate how much power China has in Pyongyang. They, have, they do have influence, and they do have companies, and they do have economic relationships that could make life much more difficult in the North. Their balancing act is how, how much worse can we make it in the North without creating that which scares us more than anything, which is a collapse in the North. And then what happens to all those nuclear weapons? We end up with millions of refugees crossing our border. So the Chinese biggest fears really are collapse in the north or reunification of the peninsula, basically under the south. <coughs> so they're, they're going to work very hard to avoid that. It's clear the relationship between China and North Korea has hardly ever been worse. Um, uh, Kim Jong-un has never been to Beijing uh, in his leadership. President Xi has never been to North Korea. That's a first in that relationship. The Chinese press are saying some amazingly negative things about the North and about Kim Jong-un. So, so they are weighing in and they are bringing 
greater pressure. Whether it will be enough, I think, remains to be seen. The president told the South Koreans that they should chip in and pay for the anti-ballistic missile system, the THAAD system. Is that a kind of a mixed message when you're... Well, I think, let's just say that a week or two before the uh, South Korean election, it was at least poorly timed. Syria. There was a missile strike in Syria. What is the lasting impact of that, do you think? Well, actually, I'm, I'm with a lot of other people. I thought it was a good thing to do. Um, it showed the United States has not just completely dealt itself out of the uh, situation with respect to uh, Assad and, and uh, his future. It sort of, sort of went back and in a way validated the, the red line that President Obama had, uh, had drawn. Uh, it is a one-off. Um, They've now taken steps, you know, they've moved their airplanes to where the Russians are and so on and so forth. But I think it sent a, I think it sent a useful message. But it is, it is still a one-off. It's not a strategy. What, do you see a strategy? Um, well, I think that the strategy, as, as I see it, and I've, this is all just based on reading newspapers, is, is to keep focused on destroying ISIS and that that's the first priority. And, and um, the other things are kind of wh wh what kind of a political settlement there might be. <coughs> Various other things in Syria, I think, are kind of secondary to, to getting the job done at Raqqa and in Mosul and, and doing everything they can to destroy ISIS. Last question. President Trump has given the military a freer hand in operations. Uh, what are the benefits of that and what are the possible risks of that? Well, I think that uh, I can speak first of all to the benefits. I cannot tell you the countless hours I and senior officials at the Defense Department spent sort of monitoring individual soldiers and then numbers to stay within the limits that um, that have been imposed by the White House in Afghanistan and in Iraq. It, it went to doing crazy things like having to break up units and send part of a unit because we couldn't get over the number. So it was a level of micromanagement that just the, the, the military guys would just roll their eyes. So I think, <clears throat> and, and, and getting down to almost uh, Lyndon Johnson in Vietnam kind of review of targets and things. So I think giving the military more flexibility tactically and to manage the numbers. And, and I think on numbers, it seems to me that the president should give the Pentagon sort of a range and say, I want, I want you to stay within this range, but if you need more, come back to me. But within that, you can manage it any way you want. And I think within giving them some broad guidelines in terms of targets, let them do it. I remember uh, President, first President Bush sent me over to the Pentagon, much to the chagrin of Secretary of Defense Cheney and uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Colin Powell <coughs> to review the target lists in Iraq during the first Gulf War. And they, they were really annoyed by it. <laughs> And, and fortunately, I had a good relationship with, with them. And basically, they said, see, we don't have any hospitals. We don't have any mosques. We don't have any churches. We don't have any schools. I said, OK, we're good. But, so I think the president should draw the broad guidelines and provide the strategy, but then give the military the flexibility to actually fight the, the, to carry out that strategy as necessary. I think there needs to be a good reporting mechanism back to the president so he knows what's going on. I wasn't required to tell the president every time I was going to deploy uh, forces. But it, when those forces were going to likely be in combat or have American lives at risk, I never thought it was a good idea to surprise the president of the United States. And just as we've been talking here, a lot of people look at this president and think he is out of the, the bounds of the normal presidency. That's partially political. That's partially partisan. But it's also because of there's been a lot of uh, uh, exciting activity in Washington, but your descriptions and assessment of the administration seems like you see him within the bounds of a normal presidency. Is that fair? I think that I think that it's 
I mean, again, I have tried to focus most of what I've talked about on the foreign policy side. That's the part I know. Um, and I, th I think we started out that I didn't think this whole business with um, Director Comey was handled well. Um, <clears throat> so there are sort of day-to-day -day aspects of the operation that I think are really troublesome. And, and I know that there are a lot of people in the country who have lots of issues with decisions that he's making on the domestic side. I'll leave somebody else who's expert in that to talk about that. Um, the thing that reassures me some on the foreign policy side is that he and his team seem to have worked out a relationship of trust and a lot of the extraneous or extemporaneous uh, things that were going on early on have largely settled out. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much. Thank you.